Welcome, everyone. We're going to start this meeting. Mary Rokoff. Mm. Mayor Bruner. Yes. Vice Mayor Rich. Here. Commissioner Clark. Here. Commissioner Collins. Here. Commissioner McDonald. Here. And then our invocation is by Ed Skiba, our Stewart Police Chaplain. You can lead us into the Pledge of Allegiance right after that, too, if you don't mind. Madam Mayor, Council Members, Mr. City Manager, Mr. City Attorney, thank you very much. And most importantly, the people of Stewart, thank you for inviting the presence of the Lord into these proceedings. It's critical in today's society with the things we see going on. And I appreciate the fact that you allow the invocation of his spirit into these proceedings. Let's go before the Lord. Our God and our Father, great creator of the universe, we once again come before you to discuss the things that are important to your people. In the book of Romans, your word says that all authority comes from God. The authority that my brothers and sisters have on this council has come from you to represent us. Father, we thank you that they conduct these proceedings with integrity, with unity, with respect for each other, despite maybe some diverse opinions and, and uh, perspectives. But Lord, you allow each one to speak their own mind. As they do that, Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit guidance on each issue that they are about to discuss, that your spirit is felt throughout all decisions that are made throughout everything that's discussed. Lord, just come now and send your spirit and be with us in your precious name and for your glory do we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join me now as we pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have the, the arts moment, Stuart Middle School Marketing and Arts teachers. Hello. Good afternoon, commissioners and guests. We appreciate your valuable time, and we are honored to be here to showcase the exceptional marketing and arts program at Stuart Middle School. Let me introduce myself. I'm Stephanie Davis Chang, the CTE marketing teacher, and accompanied by my talented Cheryl Adza, our esteemed art teacher. Our first design, which I'm going to go to right now, was created by the marketing department. It is our new school crest. This crest stands for Stuart Middle School's dedication to provide an extraordinary education to every student, which is unparalleled. Our unwavering commitment to achieving success remains steadfast, but we have embraced a more strategic approach. Our goal is to establish Stuart Middle School as a beacon of excellence, not only through our outstanding academic athletic achievements, but also by offering a comprehensive and rigorous educational experience. We empower our students to harness the power of cutting edge technology and access the most sought after resources. With a wide range of clubs, athletics, and a comprehensive core curriculum that encompasses the arts, music, health, career development, science, and CTE, our students are equipped to thrive in any pursuit they choose. Choose Stuart Middle School for an education that sets the highest standard of excellence. Now Cheryl would like to say a few words regarding her art students and the program, and I'll click for you if that's okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, these works that you're about to see, are, there's a few examples up here. Our students uh, researched about the history of Stuart and chose their subject matter. They, um, many worked in pairs and then uh, also had about two and a half weeks of working time. In addition, they got to design and choose their medium. The students have been um, our students have been recognized in other areas, um, and if they didn't choose a, also going back, if they didn't choose a, um, a place, then they chose, uh, we had a sailfish option, so they designed their sailfish. Um, our students have also been recognized in various art endeavors, such as Martin Arts Chalk Arts Festival. We won second place and also honorable mention. And in Brian Mass Art Contest, we won first place in 2023. Wow. So um, there's a few 
things, and uh, a couple of them are up here. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank you. I have a proclamation. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies, ladies, thank you. Before you leave, to the proclamations of uh, Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, April 14th through 20, 2024. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, sir. All right. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require police, fire, or emergency medical services. When an emergency occurs, the prompt response of police officers, firefighters, and paramedics is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property. And whereas the safety of our police officers and firefighters is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who telephone the City of Stewart's Emergency Communications Center, and whereas public safety telecommunicators are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with emergency services, public safety telecommunicators are the single vital link for our police officers and firefighters by monitoring their activities by radio, providing them information, and ensuring their safety. And whereas public safety telecommunicators of the City of Stewart have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and treatment of patients, and each dispatcher has exhibited compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their job in the past year. Now, therefore, I, Rebecca S. Bruner, Mayor of the City of Stewart, Florida, do hereby proclaim the week of April 14th through the 20th, 2024, in the City of Stewart, Florida, as Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Thank you. Um, Mr. City Manager, could I ask you a question? I was, I was at the Martin County presentation, and this figure struck me. They answered 28,000 911 calls last year. 20, that's Some seven. of them are mine. Is that, <laughs> does the city, do we answer, our, do we have a number ourselves? I, I can I bring that back to you. They, they probably know it. And they can. <laughs> I mean, that is a remarkable. Honestly, off the top of my head, I can't tell you what our number is. Um, we answer a lot. Next gen 911 that we do get point based 911 calls. So if you're actually standing in the Let's city to, the to a tower in the area, it comes directly to us. It used to have all the mobile phones used to kind of go to the county, they had the towers. Now they don't. So we are getting a lot more 911 calls. We also take care of all of the city non emergency calls as well. I don't know if people know that as well. We just don't answer for the police department. We get public works calls. We get um, people that want to talk to the building department, permitting. <laughs> we get everybody. So we answer a whole lot of phone calls. Well, I, well, I think your recognition is well deserved. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Tammy Champion. I'm the dispatch supervisor for the city of Stewart. I've been there for a little while as supervisor, I think 16 years now. Yeah. And we have eight full-time dispatchers. Right now we're at seven. We're trying to get one more. Uh, we have three part-time dispatchers. They're kind of my bread and butter. They fill in for vacations. They fill in for people calling in sick and when we are short people. So my, my people, I have <laughs> Diane Kirkland. She's been there the longest. How long? 25 years. 
is actually one of our new hires and she's just learning and she's in training. <laughs> uh, also would like to mention, sorry, um, we'd like to invite the city commission to come in and sit in to see exactly what our job is in dispatch. Cool. And do it, and do it for eight to ten hours. <laughs> Just a uh, brief moment, Chief Simonelli, store please. Bring up the mic, Chief. Thanks. The uh, ladies who work in dispatch, obviously, uh, they get the call first before the cop even gets it and goes there to the problem. So they are the true first responder. What I'm going to do is actually have this transcribed and put a proposal in for more dispatchers, just to let you know. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate the recognition for them. Thank you. Thank you. This is Donate Life Month, April 2024. Lee, could you read that for me, please? Of course. Whereas one of the most meaningful gifts that a human being can bestow upon another is the gift of life. Over 103,000 men, women, and children are currently on the national waiting list for organ transplantation, of which over 5,100 reside in Florida. And whereas a number of transplants, nearly 47,000, occurred in 2023 thanks to the generosity of over 23,000 deceased and living donors, of which 3,300 transplant patients and more than 1,300 deceased and living donors were from Florida. And whereas the need for organ, eye, and tissue donation remains critical as, new patient is added, as a new patient is added to the national waiting list for an organ transplant every eight minutes, and each day roughly 17 people die due to the lack of available organs. And whereas more than 11.3 million Floridians have already registered their decision to give the gift of life through organ and tissue donation at www.donatelifeflorida.org or on their driver's license. Nonprofit uh, LifeLink of Florida is dedicated to the recovery of organs and tissue for transplantation therapy in Florida with a mission to honor donors and save lives. Now, therefore, I, Rebecca S. Bruner, mayor of the city of Stewart, Florida do hereby proclaim the month of April 2024 in the city of Stewart, Florida as Donate Life Month. Thank you. The recipient is Tara uh, Mahovitz. Yes. Commissioners and guests, thank you so much. I can't tell you how it warms my heart to hear that Stuart, my hometown, has proclaimed April as Donate Life Month. That means so much to me. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to take up much of your time, but I did want to share something personal with you. If you didn't hear, I'm a native. <laughs> And I really take pride in that. I grew up in Palm City. I was born at the hospital down the street, which is going to have a donate flag raising next week, which is amazing. Yes. Anyway, um, I grew up in Palm City. 
I met my best friend when we were 10 years old. Her name's Denise. Three years ago, she almost died. She needed a new liver, and she was on the transplant list, which you read the numbers, is humongous. Thankfully, there's a program called Living Donors where you can donate a kidney or part of your liver to someone as you're alive. I was able to do so, and my best friend will turn 50 next month. <laughs> Thank you. So it's because of proclamations. It's because of us talking with one another. It's about sharing with our families that we have decided upon our death, please, use my organs. I don't need them. You can save eight lives, one person. So thank you, Stuart, for proclaiming April Donate Life Month. Thank you, ma'am, very much. And next is our uh, Child Abuse Prevention Month. Okay. Lee, please report me. All right, sure. Whereas child abuse and neglect is a serious problem affecting every segment of our community and finding solutions requires input and action from everyone. And whereas our children are the most are our most valuable resources and will shape the future of the city of Stewart, Florida. Child abuse can have long-term uh, psychological, emotional, and physical effects that have lasting consequences for victims of abuse. And whereas effective child abuse preventative prevention activities succeed because of the partnerships created between child welfare professionals, education, health, community, and faith-based organizations, businesses, law enforcement agencies, and families. Communities must make every effort to promote programs and activities that create strong and thriving children and families. Whereas helping people succeed is celebrating 60 years of service to the community. Through its diversified, effective program services and initiatives, hundreds of the most vulnerable uh, local children, families, and adults have been able to transform their lives through education, counseling, training, and employment. Whereas we acknowledge that we must work together as a community to increase awareness about child abuse and contribute to promote the social and emotional well-being of children and families in safe, stable, and nurturing environment, prevention remains the best defense for our children and families. Now, therefore, I, Rebecca S. Bruner, Mayor of the City of Stewart, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2024 as Child Abuse Prevention Month. And my friend Susie Hutchison is going to receive this proclamation. With Tom Kempenny, my favorite board member. Oh, oh Tom. You know what that means. You're writing a check. <laughs> With pictures first. Picture, pictures first. Mm -hmm. Picture, pictures first. Oh, we have to hold the poor little thing is. I hope I won't ever see you again like this. I recently had back surgery and thought I... Oh, wow. Well, it's a month. Mm. They did tell me if I was 30 years younger and in the same shape as Mr. Zaccio that I probably would have gotten better a lot quicker. But what we are here tonight is to talk about child abuse and child abuse prevention. It's a sad thing we talk about, but there's hope. At least 3. million cases of child abuse are reported every year in the U.S. At least one in seven children have experienced child abuse or neglect in the past year in the United States. According to recent research, 93% of victim, uh, victims of child sexual abuse know their perpetrator, and in fact, 34.2% were family members. According to a study, 50% of foster children, where so many children of abuse go, mm -hmm. uh, they're subject to domestic abuse, and 85 of them will have mental health issues as they grow up. Abused and neglected children are 11 times more likely to engage in criminal behavior as an adult. So we've got a big job ahead of us. So what, you know, what is helping people succeed doing? Well, we start out by providing what's called healthy families. 
That's an abuse and prevention program that we work in Martin County, and we work with about 500 families a year, which turns, when you talk about children and everybody, turns into a lot of people. We have 100% no abuse claims after we start working with that family. So that is one of our, just, we are so excited about that. We also provide therapy, you know, therapy with qualified therapists for children, and recently we started working with adults. You know, a lot of times it's not the child that has the problem, it's the parents that might have the problem or contribute to the problem, so we're doing that. We also provide summer camps for children whose behavior and mental health keep them from attending regular camps. And we also have therapists stationed in some of the schools. We work throughout the Martin County school system, but we actually have therapists stationed at Stewart Middle, Anderson Middle, and Murray Middle. So we are doing an awful lot to help with this, with this issue. And what are we doing locally? Well, you all got a pinwheel tonight. Pinwheels are to remind you of the whimsy and lightheartedness of children. It's what we want for all children. We want them to grow up happy, having fun. So that, and Mr. Baggett, I didn't know you, so I didn't bring you one. I apologize. I could have one delivered tomorrow. But what I would suggest is that you either take them home and put them in your yard, or put them together in front of our building, showing that you support Child Abuse Prevention Month. Um, in addition to that, there's the manicure movement. It asks everyone to start a conversation about ending child abuse. Wherever you are, bring it up at some point that you're for it. The other thing we're doing is we're painting one fingernail blue, which brings us closer to polishing off child abuse. So I happen to have blue polish with me. I would be glad to paint any one of your fingernails that will in fact support your support of polishing off child abuse. Uh, Madam Clark, would you mind showing them what it can look like? <laughs> So if you are interested, I will gladly do it. And again, this is a very serious, serious issue. Yes, but we have to look at it with the fact that we're moving forward, we have hope, and we can't just get down about it. We've got to fix it. So thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Any papers? Has Mr. No. Campany have his fingernail <laughs> painted? Are they, no, but that many we're people. Have... So far. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank but you. I've got, if anybody's interested, okay. if anybody's interested, uh, bring it up. Thank you. Bring it on up. Our, our next proclamation is Stamp Out Hunger Day. Lee, will you read the proclamation? Of course, Madam Mayor. Whereas every year on the second Saturday in May, letter carriers across the country collect non perishable food as part of the nation's largest one day food drive, distributing the donations to local food banks, and whereas the letter carriers stamp out food hunger drive is just one example of how letter carriers work to make a difference in the lives of those they serve. Since the pilot drive was held in 1991, more than a billion pounds of food have been, have been collected, and whereas food collected during the stamp out hunger food drive provides a critical supply for House of Hope and partnering local agencies who strive to empower Martin County residents to overcome hunger and hardship. Collected food items supply the four client choice pantry services in Martin County and expanding nutrition initiatives designed to combat, combat the rise, rising levels of obesity related illnesses in lower income households. And whereas we would like to recognize all letter carriers for their hard work and their commitment to their communities. All food collected in our community stays in our community and we support carriers' efforts to help those in need in our community. Now, therefore, I, Rebecca S. Bruner, Mayor of the City of Stewart, Florida, do hereby proclaim the May, that May 11, 2024, in the City of Stewart, Florida, as Stamp Out Hunger Day. And our, the proclamation, the recipient is Deidre Kinnaman, House of Hope's Director of Operations. Oh, we're going to get the letter? <laughs> well, 
Um, thank you, City Commission of Stewart, for your incredible support for claiming this day in honor of the National Association of Letter Carriers Stamp Out Hunger Food Drive. We are truly great for, grateful for this recognition and your commitment to combating hunger in our community. In the past year, House of Hope has assisted the community by providing an astonishing 1.3 million pounds of food, which included 500,000 pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables, reaching over 21,000 people and more than 30 nonprofit organizations with vital food assistance monthly. This year marks the 31st annual National Association of Letter Carrier Stamp Out Hunger Food Drive, where the food is generously donated by residents of the community. Historically, this drive has provided between 60 and 70,000 pounds of food to our organization each year. These generous donations have been invaluable in our efforts to ensure that no one in our community goes hungry. We extend our sincere gratitude to the City of Stewart for acknowledging the importance of the annual event and supporting the efforts of the National Association of Letter Carriers, the United States Postal Service, and the countless volunteers who make this food drive a resounding success year after year. Your proclamation highlights the city's commitment to addressing food insecurity and supporting organizations like ours that work tirelessly to serve those in need. Thank you once again for this recognition. It will serve as an inspiration for us to continue our work with renewed vigor and determination, ensuring that every individual in our community has access to nutritious food. We are honored to have the support of the city of Stewart and the generous residents in this community in this noble endeavor. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Lupus Awareness Month, May. Lee, will you read this proclamation, please? Of course, Madam Mayor. Whereas lupus is an unpredictable and misunderstood autoimmune disease that can cause severe damage to the tissue and organs in the body, and in some cases, death, and whereas more than 1.5 million Americans and 5 million worldwide suffer from the devastating effects of this cruel and mysterious disease, including over 100,000 Floridians. And whereas lupus can be particularly difficult to diagnose because it is, its symptoms are similar to those of many other illnesses and major gaps exist in understanding the causes and consequences of lupus. More than half of all people with lupus take four or more years and visit three or more doctors before obtaining a correct diagnosis. And, while, and whereas while lupus strikes mostly women of childbearing age, no one is safe from lupus. African Americans, Hispanics, Latinos, Asians, Native, and Native Americans are two to three times more likely to develop lupus, a disparity that remains yet unexplained. And whereas lupus organizations calls for increases in public and private sector funding for medical research on lupus, targeted education programs for health professionals, patients, and the public and recognition of lupus as a significant public health issue. Now, therefore, I, Rebecca S. Bruner, Mayor of the City of Stewart, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2024 as Lupus Awareness Month. Our recipient for this proclamation is Pamela Klinger Malazzo, Ambassador of Lupus Foundation of America. <laughs> I'm an ambassador for the Lupus Foundation of America, the organization whose sole mission is to improve the quality of life for all people affected by lupus through programs of research, education, support, and advocacy. 
In 1994, I had been experiencing symptoms of lupus for three years when my doctor suggested I be tested for lupus as a cause to my symptoms. At the time, there were very few doctors who were aware of lupus, and those who were had very little to offer us. We had no lupus-specific medications, and we, were off we often lost people because treatment options simply ran out. In 2011, the FDA approved our first lupus-specific medication, a wait of over 50 years. A decade later, our second lupus-specific medication was approved in 2021, and a third specifically for lupus kidney disease. While science and research have given us more answers and treatments, we will sadly continue to lose people when options run out. We know that being diagnosed with lupus in the early stages is imperative. Symptoms can be unclear, can come and go, can change. On average, it takes nearly four to six years for people with lupus to be diagnosed from the time they first notice their symptoms. Surprisingly, a 2020 survey found that less than half of Americans asked had never heard of lupus, knew very little about it, especially as in the populations that are higher at risk for developing the disease, making lupus an invisible illness. So how can we make lupus visible? Ambassadors like myself across the country commit to partnering with the Lupus Foundation to raise awareness, provide resources, educate their communities. We share tools and resources to help them manage their disease. We are the voice raised for all people affected by lupus. And then we come to people like all of you, the leaders of our community, and ask you to stand with us while we raise our voices. This proclamation acknowledges lupus and all who are affected by it. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, for helping me to make lupus more visible in the city of Stewart. You bet. Thank you Thank very you. much. We're going to move right along to our presentations, service awards for April. I have Robert Carson, 10 years of service with the fire department. Yay. And he's not attempting. He's not here. Pass it on. Yay. And another, another award. Um, oh, cool. Jordan Pinkston, five years of service in the CRA. Jordan. Jordan and Amy. She's here. She there she is. There she is. <laughs> She started, she had no children. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Five years. Five years later? <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted to say thank you to all of you and, um, of course, to Panal, my director. She's been with me for the whole five years I've been here. So I'm excited to see where we grow as a CRA, and I appreciate everything that you've done for me. So thank, thank you. you. We appreciate you very much. And then our next recipient, Jerry Thomas, Jr., five years of service, utilities and engineering. I would like to thank everyone in the city of Stewart for giving me the opportunity to help make Stewart a better place and contribute to everything else for success for the residents and everyone else who's visiting. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Thank you very much. We have the legislative update. Oh, yes. Mayor, we have Ben Hogarth who will be giving you your legislative update for the session. 
I, I apologize. Ben, thank you. Sorry, Ben. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, ben Hogarth from Community Services Department, for the record. Um, normally, I have PowerPoint presentations. I figured I'd spare everybody uh, that for tonight and just quickly, briefly recap some of the, the highlights from the session this year. Um, to start off, the session ended up with about 1,900, almost 2,000 bills. So staff spent a lot of time, of course, reviewing, and as these bills got amended over time, having to constantly re-review <laughs> each bill. And uh, thankfully, out of the 2,000, um, really less than uh, a couple hundred, really of any note kind of passed, and out of those, maybe about 10 to 20 of any relevant um, material to us that, that we had to go through. So thankfully, there wasn't a lot there. Um, the, the handout that I provided, uh, in the agenda item. Hopefully, we'll go into a little bit more detail each of the items that did pass. Um, and a couple of the ones that we were following that, that failed by the end, but made it all the way to the end. So it's something to, to kind of keep in mind when I go through this. So um, as far as affordable housing, SB 328 did pass. Uh, that was something that I covered in the, the recap kind of halfway through the session uh, a couple months ago. So everything that you might have seen in, in any of my lengthy emails about that bill, because it's such a, between 102 last year and then uh, 328, uh, 328 modifying it this year, there was a lot. So if you ever have any questions on that one, I'm sure staff is going to have to do a lot of technical analysis in the next couple of months to see if there's anything we missed. It's a, it's a pretty hefty bill. Even even 102, we're still reevaluating. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to note for the public's uh, interest that that had in fact did pass. So um, a couple of bills that I highlighted on the residential building permit side is something for planning to keep in mind. We're seeing the, the state legislature limit um, how much time staff has to review uh, building permits. So that creates more challenge, of course, among staff. It also uh, creates more opportunity for us to make a mistake or to, to not see something, not really give an application as much time. Thankfully, these changes that we saw this year only apply to residential uh, developments, but they do create more um, concise timelines that we need to abide by. So there's more opportunities for gotcha and, you know, we made a mistake and it's just something that staff is going to have to just be mindful of in the future. The concern, of course, is in the is in the distant future. Does this get modified again in future iterations to, to, to further hamstrung um, local right. government? So that's that's the only concern there. But that was uh, HB 267 and SB 812 in the packet. So if you see that, if there's anything that stands out to you, have any questions again, feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to go into detail. Um, a cybersecurity liability, uh, incident liability bill passed. This is good for us. Um, it helps reduce or eliminate liability for us as long as we're following kind of the state's um, and federal government cybersecurity um, issue. And of course, uh, the city of Stewart having been a, kind of a victim of a, of a hack, just like many cities in Florida now have been, um, you know, it's something that's uh, near and dear to our heart to, to keep that in mind that we continue to, to do the good practices to protect um, information and to protect uh, the city's data. So good news is we're, um, that, that's something to help on the liability exposure side for cities as long as we're following those standards. Um, another bill that's been a long time coming that did pass, and this is another positive bill, was PACE reform. So it might have gone under your radar during the legislature, but um, and I didn't cover it too much in the, in the midterm of, of the session because I just wanted to wait and see if it did in fact pass. Um, it's something that's been talked about for probably a decade now is reforming PACE. And there's a lot of issues uh, that would take too long to go into, but suffice to say, on the financing side, a lot of people in the state had problems or there was misinformation or just confusion on what PACE is. And so I'll just state it for the record that PACE is a property tax assessment. That's how people get um, access to what was, on, before this year, access to uh, clean energy, such as like solar for their home. Um, they could use uh, this property tax assessment rather than putting it on credit or a credit card. Um, and it might only be a percent or two higher than, than a bank interest rate, um, but it's certainly like a line of credit would be uh, cheaper on the interest side. And doing it on the tax side means that there was more regulation. So PACE has been reformed to help um, this year on that side. 
but they also expanded PACE to include now things like septic to sewer conversions um, and other resiliency or, or like home uh, improvement that, that could uh, be make the property more resilient for things like floods. So stuff that they're right now the state of Florida has said is a priority for them um, have been added to PACE. So that program can help finance something like septic to sewer conversions, which is a big positive. Uh, so that's just... A couple of things I think that was worth noting, um, and, and if you have questions specifically about the PACE program, staff is happy to, to answer those as well in the future. Um, I think just a couple more bills that, uh, that did pass. Uh, one that's not super important to us, but uh, you might remember the Surfside collapse. So there was a bill for local regulation of non-conforming and unsafe structures. So that bill did pass this year. It's to make it so that local governments can't prevent a demolition of a building that's unsafe or deemed unsafe. <clears throat> and it does have a few exemptions, but it, only, it mostly deals with properties that are on the, uh, or it's exclusively right now it deals with properties that, that are on the uh, coastal control line. So yeah. nothing in the city right now that I'm aware of um, has that issue. <clears throat> But in the future, this could be expanded. So it's something to think about. <clears throat> point of reference, I know that our, I know our building inspector has sent out the letters to those properties in the city of Stewart that have to have the engineering inspections done. That's good to know. In in the future, um, like I said, this this has been looked at for this year because of the Surfside issue. But it's something that we that we're concerned about in the future could be looked at again. And right now, demolition is something that is a hot topic in Tallahassee. So Expect another bill like that perhaps in the next couple of years. <clears throat> so local government actions, this is one of the other ones I wanted to highlight. Um, SB 170 passed last year, and it kind of inhibited uh, what we could do as a uh, government, as a local government relating to um, land development code. And you might remember me previously saying that you need a business impact estimate now. It's, a, it's another onerous step for, for staff at the local level to have to take before a local government um, commission can, can adopt an ordinance. Um, well, previously, comprehensive plan and land development regulations were exempt from this new rule from needing a business impact estimate. This year, they took that away. And so now, if we do any kind of adoption of a land development reg, any kind of adoption of a comprehensive plan amendment change, those now require this business impact estimate. And because there's not really for us um, a history of this, it's something that staff's going to have to evaluate and look at what's net, what really will suffice for that, for that qualification. So that's something for staff to think about as well on the planning and development side. Um, and this one, I remember Commissioner Rich especially brought this up earlier in the year. Um, I sent out an email a couple of weeks ago, but um, for the whole commission uh, to know the stormwater rule uh, did in fact pass this year. That was something we talked about previously. That's going to help DEP on the enforcement side um, for for uh, just pollution issues that they've had that they haven't been able to enforce for, for a couple decades now um, on so, uh, certain properties. So it is limited, but it is a good step in, the, in, the, in this process of actually trying to get some real enforcement mechanisms on property owners who might be just polluting the environment locally a little bit more than they probably should be. Um, and I'm being diplomatic about that. It's just the first step for DEP. And I think that's, um, that's a good step there. And I think the last three things are all failed bills. And these are not the only failed bills. We had um, probably 100 bills that we followed, 80, 90 of which failed earlier on in the session. These three just happen to make it a little bit further along. Um, and, it's, and probably all three will come back in some form. Uh, the first is municipal water and sewer utility rates. This also was in a different form last year, came back again this year. Uh, what it would do is it would limit how much um, additional uh, fee that we charge for utility customers that are outside of our boundary and jurisdiction. Right now, I think there's like a 25% or um, surcharge to that, and that's something that's common for, for municipalities to do for their um, for the, for their uh, utility because it's it's not only just further out, but it's these are customers that you're not collecting on in other ways. Uh, they were going to eliminate that completely um, in, in these different iterations. So that's that would be a hit to revenue for local governments. Um, sovereign immunity came back up again this year that they were going to cut, the Tallahassee was going to cut sovereign immunity, which would increase potential um, exposure for us, the, the different ways they were going to do that. This year, that completely died before um, before it could get to the House floor um, before final vote. So we were very lucky at the last minute on that one. 
and uh, local business taxes. You might have remembered me kind of sound the alarm the last time I presented on that. Uh, they were going to freeze local business taxes at the current rate that they were this year. And I shouldn't say the current rate, it, it all collected, all funds collected this year. And the problem with that is you announce something like that, and let's say all the businesses found out, I mean, it's not a heck of an incentive to, to pay your tax bill this year when you know your tax bill next year is going to be based on what was paid um, all last year. So that was a problem for everybody, the way it was worded. It was a problem with uh, freezing everything in perpetuity with more hits um, in the future, just freezing revenue. Thankfully, it died at the end um, last minute, so it's just something to think about that we probably will see again. So those uh, that's everything for the bills I just wanted to cover as a recap. On the positive side, we did get, um, I can't confirm 100% that we have it because it's going to go through the, the governor's uh, budget process, but right. the legislature did fund, at least right now, two of the three uh, funding requests that the commission made. So um, the septic to sewer conversion programs, they, they funded half of our requests there. So that was half a million dollars, and then they funded half of our request for the Guy Davis project, the same thing, half a million dollars for that. So uh, let's hope both of those make it through the uh, the funding process. The good thing about the septic to sewer conversions is, you know, we can look at creating that programmatically for people, but you add that plus what I was just talking about with the PACE program, where PACE now assessments can be used for qualifying um, septic to sewer conversions, and now that just gives our, you know, the holdout properties in the city of Stewart, a couple of options potentially to be able to to finally make those conversions in the future. So that's something to think about. Um, and so the the last three things I promised I would talk about are for this year's ballot. This is more for just public awareness. There are three issues uh, that kind of went through the legislature and kind of been talked about for a while. The first is, um, well, you remember medical marijuana went through twice to ballot initiatives. This year, you'll see, I'm sure some people have seen that in the news, the Florida Supreme Court did approve the recreational marijuana on the ballot. So that will be in November. That's something to think about planning what those impacts on the city could be like, you know, just businesses, all of that, what the, what the downtown looks like. Um, the other two ballot initiatives, Martin County, for, uh, the forever, you've seen the half cent sales surtax that we, uh, the commission, um, city commission and the county commission have uh, both supported the county commission approved to go to the ballot um, this fall. That half cent sales surtax, it's something to consider. The, we, we don't have our hands as tied um, as Martin County and what that needs to be applied for, but it's just something to consider uh, in the past. Commissions have thought about, well, how can we show the you know, the general population um, to support such a thing. Well, one of the best ways is to show them maybe some of what, not necessarily everything, but some of what you might spend it on. And since the county is spending it on you know, water quality, uh, conservation in that sense, improvements, it's something to think about in the future. And the last issue and last item that's on the ballot, again, for the for the public's awareness, is the uh, Stewart Heritage Museum, aka the old uh, feed store, the red building that's right out here. Um, that, just like all of our buildings downtown, if you're going to lease it, that building out, because um, it's city owned for longer than nine years, you need a referenda. So this year, it's my understanding that we're going to have that on the referenda. Um, to, to lease that out to, uh, I think it's $1 a year, but to lease that out to the museum um, in perpetuity, so. Yeah. But that's everything I have for tonight, unless any commissioners have any questions or anything else. We have any questions? Thanks for the other update. Ben, why did the sovereign immunity fail? I remember when I was in Tallahassee, all the legislatures, uh, legislators were very confident that we would see at least those amended limits and go up. Yeah, they had they had gone to bat two or three times already in the last couple of years. Right. I, I think everybody was shocked it didn't. Um, I, there were some late filed amendments uh, towards the end that kind of torpedoed a couple bills, and that one might have been one of them because I, I think I remember there was a one line item that they added to one of those amendments that got passed that, that effectively made it kind of a, a moot issue what the dollar amounts were because basically a city or county could just uh, settle without ever having to go to the legislature. And um, in some of, our, some of our conversations in the past, the whole potentially the reason why the legislature was even looking at sovereign immunity in the first place was they just didn't want to have to deal with liabilities up in Tallahassee and have to do these claims bills every year. It's just another thing, and when you have 60 days to, to, to do the business of the, the people, you know, having to do, you know, 100 claims bills or whatever it is every year is kind of annoying. I get it for a legislator. So I think they were trying to do this to try and take that all off their plate, um, and then they added this one little clause that was like a blanket clause at the end, and I think there was some, 
I don't know, some confusion or friction as a result of that clause, but it was a catch-all, that's all. Did, did you notice a difference in tone or character between last year's legislature and this year's? I, I, I personally, the, the amount of bills that I reviewed last year that, uh, that were clearly frustrating home rule and were intended to frustrate home rule was, was substantially greater than the bills this year that would have done the same. We didn't see as much traction. For whatever reason, it seemed um, a lot more muted. Okay, well, that was good. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner McDonald? Yeah, I was just going to say to Commissioner Rich's point, uh, I did, I've been up to Tallahassee numerous times over the last several years, and I would say that the, the tone was dramatically different um, than it was the prior session. It was, um, it was less, we're just going to ram it through. Uh, you could actually, I thought you could have more of a conversation with the members of the legislature uh, this session than the, compared to the prior, prior session. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other commissioners? Thank you so Thank much. You, Thank you, Ben. Okay, we'll move on to the Children's Service Council of Martin County. And Oops. Mayor, I'm going to grab this one and give it a little preliminary presentation. Um, come Thank on up, you. folks. <clears throat> Our group right here with the East Stewart Youth Initiative. Come on up to the podium. Our Children's Services um, of Martin County created a local initiative based on the Book Smart Challenge program. And uh, it's a platform to enhance readings to households, digital platform, to grade school um, students K through five, which included J.D. Parker. Um, Children's Services Council spun off a local program and got our children to participate in a local competition of all the funded programs throughout uh, Martin County. Oh, that's and awesome. our children over at the East Stewart Community Center, awesome. our East Stewart Youth Initiative won. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Um, and we also have is, um, we have, uh, Kiana Kelly here to be able to go ahead and tell you a little bit about the program. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, Ms. Kelly. Greetings. Sure. So first of all, I'm happy to be here. Last time I was here, if you guys remember, I was asking for the Celebrate Literacy Proclamation. That was back in January. I am also the Book Smart Ambassador. So I had reached out and said, you know, what is a good way to sort of get Book Smart on the map here? And what I wanted to do was have my OST or out of school programs, all of the providers were invited to participate in this challenge. So I call it the Let's Race to Read Challenge. And I have the flyer for Book Smart for the commissioners just in case they're interested or want to download it. I know you guys want to read some children's books. Um, <laughs> and so the ESY, um, first, if I may, just say a couple of things. One, the, o the out of school programs have a tremendous work that they do. They are dealing with you know, so many different competing priorities and to even ask them to do anything, you know, in addition to what they're already doing and all the ways that they're navigating is a tremendous ask. So I'm, I was grateful for everyone who said, yes, I'll do it. Um, but I was so excited that ESY was the, that were the ones that were able to complete this challenge. So on behalf of David Heaton, my executive director, and Laura Hasse, and the Martin Reed Steering Committee, I want to go ahead and present them with their certificate. So if I can tell you what they had to do first, Martin, the Booksmart is a digital platform, and the kids had to download the app and read a certain amount of books. 25 was the maximum for the time period. It ran from the end of January to the middle of March, and the ESY Center was the winner. So I first want to present them with their award oh, nice. for completing, for competing. Miss <laughs> Jada, I don't have an award for you, but you know I love you, right? 
Okay. <laughs> I do have awards and gifts for the two highest readers who were Julian Lopez. Wow. Come on, Julian. Oh, and the green bag is yours. Right there. And Michaela. And the gold bag is yours. And Ara. Ara, sorry. Really good. And Genesis. And these, Ms. Jada, are the awards for the remaining children in your class that weren't here today. Um, so the winner of the Book Smart Challenge got quite you know, they got quite a haul, and I'm excited about that because I wanted to make it, I wanted to really encourage them to read. It's not that every single time you do something that you're going to get such a great reward, but I really wanted to kind of bust out the gate with something big. And we were very blessed to have Mr. Softy, Karen, and Mike were very generous to um, donate an ice cream party, which the kids partaked in last week. All of the kids got certificates. And Michaela and Julian also got donated passes to the Children's Museum from Nancy Bensenberger, Nancy Bensenberg, from the Children's Museum, the education director. And, and the rest of the kids also got an ice cream party. So we are really, really happy to do that. And it's just the beginning with Booksmart. It's just one platform, one way. As we talked about during Celebrate Literacy Week, this is going to be a journey, and it's going to take all of us. And I'm just really grateful that we had this small victory so early on. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. And before we conclude for the picture, I would like to uh, congratulate Darmanique Butler and her staff for working so well with our children over there. And this is thank a great you. result. Our city, Mind go, Jim. Our city. Wait for the mayor. <laughs> mayor in the middle. All right. There we go. Make sure I can see all the faces. We're good. Thank you. Thank you, thanks, Darwin. Nice job, Jim. We're going to go to uh, Federal Railroad Administration Quiet Zone Establishment Process. Milton. <laughs> Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, Milton Leggett, Public Works Director, along with my counterpart here, Peter Coonan, yes. Utilities Engineer Director. Uh, tonight we're going to look at a, uh, what they call a uh, quiet zone presentation. And with that we will cover a, um, what is called a uh, overview that will cover the basics of a quiet zone, the City of Stewart quiet zone overview, and the quiet zone process. Mr. Peter. Thank you. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Mayor Bruner, commissioners. So uh, this, this presentation uh, is really a, uh, uh, to provide information to all of you with respect to uh, a meeting <coughs> that we had with the uh, gentleman from the Federal Railroad Administration, uh, Mr. Rory Newton, last month. And uh, it has to do with what is uh, uh, going to be required for the application and approval of uh, quiet zones uh, within the city of Stewart. So initially, um, he provided us with a, a, a brief um, overview, uh, and that's what uh, we are going to present to you this afternoon. It will involve uh, the basics of a quiet zone. Uh, the City of Stewart uh, Quiet Zone Overview with the uh, proposed locations of the rail crossings and the Quiet Zone process. First of all, uh, why do tra uh, trains sound horns? It's a good question. 
Now, the uh, railroads are regulated by the uh, Federal Railroad Administration, also known as the FRA, and it's a matter of safety. Uh, train horns, uh, they're required by the FRA, and uh, certain decimal level requirements for the, uh, the sound levels, and advance notice uh, prior to uh, uh, the train reaching a rail crossing. So a quiet zone is, uh, it exists where a train horn does not need to sound. However, there are uh, situations where a train will need to sound its horn. That's uh, in an emergency situation or some kind of a, a safety situation where the uh, locomotive <coughs> engineer sees something where a, uh, it's felt that a, a train horn is required, such as a vehicle in the intersection or pedestrians in the, the intersection. Uh, the crossings need to be upgraded to be safer without the horns than they are in their current state with the horns. So to achieve this, uh, supplemental safety measures at every crossing would be required if they're not there already and uh, uh, designed uh, pertaining to the quiet zone risk index would need to be met. So we're at the very preliminary stage of all of this, uh, phase one. And as I mentioned to you, we, we just met with the uh, Federal Rail Road Administration last month. And uh, so the initial, uh, the initial part is going to be agency coordination, which will then be followed by conceptual design, safety analysis of, of each railroad crossing. Public outreach is there as a, as a future component of this, as well as the final report to the commission. The phase two is the implementation phase. And that involves permitting through the, the FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, there's also design, uh, preliminary design, final design. Of course, uh, that is a, a process by itself. Uh, funding, uh, how much is this gonna cost? We don't know yet, but that's something that uh, would be determined. It will ultimately lead to construction of these railroad crossings with the implementations of quiet zones added to, to each one, and ultimately the uh, FRA, the certification at the end of the, the construction. So all this will involve agency coordination. So uh, we have already reached out and met with the Federal Railroad Administration. We still uh, will be setting up and scheduling to meet with the Florida East Coast Railroad in the, in the future. As far as the City of Stewart Quiet Zone area, it will consist of uh, five crossings, starting from the south and working to the north. It starts at uh, the crossing at Florida Street, followed by Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, Confusion Corner, Joan Jefferson or Sailfish, Sailfish Circle, and then Fern Street. So with that, each crossing will be reviewed to determine what measures would be required to meet, to meet certain safety criteria. And the safety improvements uh, would consist of implementations of uh, quadrant gates or supplementation of existing quad, uh, gate, gate arms if, they, if there aren't already four quadrant gates. Uh, flexible lane delineators, and uh, refreshed or updated uh, signage and roadway striping. So this is an example of a, a four quadrant gate, and essentially you have gate arms at, at, the, at the four locations to prevent a vehicle from driving around two gate arms that are down and, and making a way, their way across the crossing. Flexible lane delineators uh, are also uh, the type of devices that, that would be implemented, also 
the intent to prevent uh, vehicles from being able to travel around either a gate arm or in switch into another lane, just keep the vehicles within the, 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 the same lanes that they're in. And then updated uh, roadway striping and signage. <clears throat> so uh, we have uh, with, uh, at the beginning, these, these, the following photographs show the existing conditions or existing photos of each one of the railroad crossings that we're talking about. So this is the one at Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, uh, the one at Confusion Corner, the one at Joan Jefferson, the one at Fern Street. A component of all of this will be public outreach, and uh, that is, uh, will happen uh, in the future. It's, part, it's, it's a requirement. It's getting the public involved. It's a good thing. And uh, ultimately, all these, uh, uh, all, all these steps will be brought together in the form of a report, an engineering type of report, in which uh, recommendations uh, will be provided to the, the city commission. And then the implementation, as I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, it will involve the design process, the permitting process, uh, getting funding for this, and ultimately the construction. So with that, uh, we're here for any questions that, that you uh, may have at this time. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter and Milton. Um, Becky, can I, yes, can I ask you a question? Commissioner? This is not really a question, it's just a comment. Yes. So I, you know, I have a concern, well, we all do have a concern about safety and crossing and the bright line and I've witnessed so many things which are near misses, and I know that we've had things that have happened. And um, I missed a little part of your presentation, but I, I just don't know if um, at some point if like a sign could be put up, I don't know if a sign helps, but I've seen where one side of the arm is up, the other side is down, the light is still flashing red, but somebody who was a pedestrian may try to walk across, which I'm sure is what happens when the bright line comes 20 seconds later mm -hmm. and somebody gets hurt. Um, if there's some way that, you know, I don't know people, I don't know what other warning needs to happen. Just don't cross unless all the arms are up and it's absolutely green. Same thing with driving, but it does look like it's finished, but it's not finished and then suddenly the arm goes back down again. And it's just really, and then I think people make some bad judgment calls, especially pedestrians. Well, it's a it's a good it's a good point. Um, it uh, it sounds like uh, what could be part of this as well could be the synchronization uh, of the and the timing of the the gate arms with respect to the the approaching train or or trains, depending on you could have trains coming in in both directions. That's what happened. So uh, what, uh, what we'll do, uh, we have a, we're scheduling a meeting with uh, the gentleman, uh, Rory Newton, with the uh, Federal uh, Railroad Administration for, for this month. And, uh, but I'll shoot him an email uh, after, tonight, after this afternoon's meeting just to make him aware and maybe he could, he could look into it. As far as changing any signage, uh, well, we still have to do the, the review of each rail crossing for not only signage but also the the gate arms, uh, whether it be uh, can, uh, gate arms for the vehicles. If I can chime in briefly too. I, yes. I, I, uh, Captech Engineering has been <clears throat> managing the intersections for the city for many years, including the Bright Line improvements. And I did speak to Joe Capper briefly prior to this presentation. And uh, Corey had mentioned to uh, Peter and Milton and I, <coughs> in evaluating Confusion Corner, there's an exit gate on one road that's missing um, that he said, and he did the math for us. It was kind of interesting because he would show us in the calculator like a scenario and whether or not we could achieve quiet zones or not. And that one particular gate is an absolute requirement for us. And so we're going to yes. be looking into that. And then I talked to uh, Joe about some signalization or 
signs and like for example i don't know if you've ever been um in one of those cities where they have <coughs> like the three foot tall traffic light yeah. Yeah. and he was talking about possibly on the uh traveling north on dixie highway if you had a traffic light right there that when the train was coming and the gates were going to go down for when they get into they call the slot or whatever that zone is if that light could automatically go red so that the cars couldn't go into the corner that would let the other cars in the intersection come out so that the cars wouldn't get blocked inside the gate. And then he also said we could evaluate even just putting a stop sign there instead of a yield before the traffic circle to alleviate that consistent thing. And then I know that uh, our CRA director has had him designing some plans and it'll be coming forward as well for some modifications to Dixie Highway that he believes will also um, enhance the uh, intersection as well, or intersections. But overall, um, the, the, the real point was to provide some information, because I know you guys have been asking, I know a lot have been asking you about the city's um, intention and quiet zones and what's going on. Um, it remains our position at this point to kind of follow the lead of the county and, and hopefully be included in the county's uh, application if they have apply for quiet zones, but uh, Milton and Peter and I were really looking at it without quiet zones, like we didn't care. It was more of safety. what's safe safety. and what's going to yes. make it safe mm -hmm. and how do we make it safer because lastly, one thing is if you get quiet zones, it just means that they don't have to blow the horn every single time automatically, but they have their own requirements that if as they come up to the intersection if they see an animal a vehicle or a person in the crossing they have to blow the horn anyway so if it's a quiet zone and it's two o'clock in the afternoon and they're coming up on confusion corner there will never be a time that they don't blow the horn however at 11 o'clock at night or four in the morning with a freight train if in fact there's literally no cars in the intersection and we have it court the corridor sealed properly the residents living close to that could be alleviated from the uh horn sound but i you know there's a lot going on these guys have been doing all sorts of uh hypotheticals and design concepts and traffic counts too yeah and traffic and the traffic counts are going on right yeah, now by the end of the week mr motel oh good Madam Mayor. Yes, yes, Commissioner. So when this gentleman made his initial evaluation of these crossings, did he feel like there was an opportunity here to achieve much safer crossings and much more sensible designs of the ingress and egress to these intersections? Well, Commissioner, with the uh, the first the first meeting that we had uh, was was. Uh, we did have some we did have some safety uh, features already in place, but uh, more more are going to be re required. Uh, to what extent we're not quite sure yet, but we will have subsequent meetings with uh, with Mr. Newton, and uh, also go out uh, and assess each each of those crossings out uh, um, with Ms. Mr. Newton, and also a gentleman from the Department of Transportation. Um, did not uh, he did not indicate that uh, it, it's a you know, that, that it couldn't be done, but certain measures will have to be implemented to to make it doable. You know, it's it's one thing to drive through these intersections, and that can be perilous enough. But I was actually took some time, and I was with the city manager and somebody else, and we were standing there for a while. Man, it's crazy. <laughs> it is. I mean. Those are difficult intersections to navigate, and that's for those of us who live here. I, I can't even imagine what it's like for visitors to the city trying to get into and out of Confusion Corner and over. So, you know, I think we have a good opportunity on an issue that has massive consensus, which is, can we please limit the amount of time these horns are being blown? So I think we can accomplish a great deal here. <laughs> Mad Madam Mayor, may I yes, say something? Yes. Again, this is another safety thing, and it may not meet with all of the 
ITE regulations or the railroad regulations. And I don't know, we may be the only city if we ever do this, but is there any way in terms of um, uh, traffic warning, let's say that you're coming up East Ocean Boulevard, up, up Colorado, and you're approaching there at Confusion Corner, is there something that we as a city can do in terms of signage? You are approaching a railroad, whatever, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> something, <laughs> anything. Like Mr. Mortel, will help. like the city manager said, we're looking at this with Mr. Uh, CapTech and everything, and you know, we'll look at those options as we move closer toward you know, whatever the city decides to do. And, okay. and we also have to be careful on, on, on signage because there's a tipping point. Mm -hmm. And as you're driving down Colorado now, there's already a lot of information being blurred out. And if you put too many signs, they stop reading all of them and yeah. they see nothing yeah. at all. Right. Yeah. It's hard. It's, it's, it's hard. But we'll be presenting it to you further. And I, and I intend to continue with uh, Cap Tech Engineering and obviously with Peter and Milton, they're keeping the data, and once we have the traffic <laughs> counts and know what the actual number of cars are, that's a huge component of the formula on the, um, whatever it's called, the calculator. Uh, the, without that number, we really can't even start doing the calculator, so this will really be helpful. Madam Mayor, as long as we get it done while Mr. Uh, Milton is still <laughs> with us. That's I think Thank we can you, manage gentlemen. that, but I don't know how long he's planning to stay. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Do I have any comments from any of the commissioners? Oh, is it comment time? You're like going to be first or yes. Troy? Yes, Commissioner Clark. You're going to be first or you want me to be first? No, you, you, you. Yes. Oh, as you can tell from um, today's agenda since 4 o'clock, We've had so many things happening in April. April is a bountiful month. In fact, it's such a bountiful month that it's also my birthday month. <laughs> and I want to thank the city of Stewart for the happy birthday <laughs> card and for the little birthday gadget thing, which I don't know how to manage, but I'll figure it out. It is a little bit semi-prejudicial, but I will accept it. Because it has tools. It's a little carpenter's yeah, box. Yeah, it's a carpenter's <laughs> box, but that's okay. I'll take it. That means that we're all Why equalized. A carpenter's box, that's okay. <laughs> it's a little bit on the male side, but that's right. It could be anybody. It could be anybody. Hey. It could be anybody. We're all carpenters. Wow, I dare you. <laughs> I don't we're think Project Lift would say that. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's, I'm glad I brought that up. Yes, yeah, so, 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 but thank you so much. And um, I don't think that, um, I'm not sure. I was going to say something about the environmental awards, but I didn't actually sign up to go to the event, so I don't even know when it is, but maybe city manager will bring it up. But um, that's about it. And the PACE program, the PACE reform that Ben brought up, I've had people calling me now because taxes are due and they're finding out that they have to pay this because it's a property assess clean energy program and it's really affecting people in the city of Stewart, people who own their homes and then they realize that they have a huge bill to pay because they had gotten the home improvement through the PACE program. So it's, uh, and I'm sure it was all explained to them, but when they see it on their tax bill, it's a whole different story. So I'm glad that they're looking at that in Tallahassee and I'm hoping that we can continue to figure this out. And uh, we don't actually, technically we're not supposed, to, the city of Stewart doesn't really um, push pace, but people have applied through the county and they live in the city, which is all of Martin County. And so that's how we have people in the city who have the PACE program and now who have the accountability to deal with that. That's all I have, Madam Mayor. Thank, thank you. you. Any of the other commissioners? No, yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and thank you. I'd like to acknowledge the mayor's remarks the other evening. What was that, Thursday evening? When we got to dedicate the, back, the new backstop at 10th Street. Okay. And that was a terrific <laughs> event. And... Um, 
many of us got to throw out the first pitch, which I thought was a much better way to do that rather than one person having to possibly embarrass themselves up there. But that's a great program, and we've acknowledged his efforts and thank him for that. So I would like to take the opportunity in our efforts to achieve clean water, our victories are few, but let's acknowledge them when they do occur. And I wanna take the opportunity to thank Ben, our own Ben Hogarth with the city of Stewart, John Mayall with Martin County, all of my fellow commissioners who come to the River Council meeting every month, all the citizens who show up and express their strong concerns. The River Coalition meeting. Mark Perry, and this is done in front of Drew Bartlett, the head of uh, South Florida Water Management District. And do our concerns control their decisions? No, I'm not that naive. But that, do they influence our, their decisions? I really think they do. I know Ben and John, they are on these calls every week. They are paying attention. They make, they share a very well-informed concern with the individuals who are making these decisions. And they know they speak for the city and they know they speak for the residents of the city. And that's very important for all of us too, to continue to talk to Toby and uh, Senator Harrell, because they know that we we do speak for the residents, and it's a small victory. A victory, but they have stopped the discharges. And Ben, correct me if I'm wrong. They have no intention of restarting them as of right now. So, thank God for that, <laughs> and we hope our waterways can recover to some degree before this very perilous storm season approaches. So thanks to all of us for accomplishing that. Brian Mass. Any, any and Brian Mass. No, you're Brian right. Mass. Yes, we need to acknowledge um, Congressman Mass. Brian Mass. Mass. No, I don't really have anything, uh, anything in particular to comment about, except for I'm looking forward to watching, uh, hopefully seeing the Delta IV rocket launch tomorrow. I think it's the last Delta IV they're going to launch, which is a really big one. So. Um, but other than that, no comment today. Well, I have uh, one. I would like to see if my uh, commissioners would agree. I would like to have uh, our um, our chief here, uh, if he can help me with uh, where I live on my street. Um, my neighbors keep coming to me, and uh, it's a four-way stop. It's uh, 7th Street and Alamanda Way, and... Five years ago, we, we thought maybe we could solve it, but we haven't. So the neighbors are very upset, and I agree. Just they, the people race uh, and just go right through the stop signs. And there's a lot of children in the neighborhood now, um, a lot. And so I was hoping maybe we could, I don't know how to slow it down. We have a little bump on uh, down on Alameda Way, and then we have another one over on Kruger. I don't know if we could have a little bump on uh, 7th Street or not, but... Um, or if you have any suggestions, I like to, for. Is there a program where if the neighbors get a petition, you can get the. Well, yeah. this, is, this is Seventh and Alamanda, and um, I, I spoke to the mayor about it before the meeting. And originally, it's a four-way stop there, so you can't really put a speed bump in a stop sign. You could put the speed bump <laughs> down the road, but the stop sign. The, the concern by the neighbors that people are running the stop sign, so the speed bump won't, it wouldn't be effective because you can't put it where there's a stop sign. We can put a, a car out, but of course, we all know how that works. Nobody runs the stop sign when the police car is sitting there, <laughs> but as soon as they leave, it's back to business. But they don't I, stop? Um, a lot I don't of know. I, that's no. what we're going to have to check Seventh into. Seventh is pretty wide open, and it's it's a bit of a thoroughfare. like you yeah, you can see seven. everything coming. Right. So you, no so cars. Maybe I'm, a couple of bumps. She's not wrong. I don't disagree yeah. with you. Well, it, you know, I'm, it's been happening. Well, and, and I can tell you that speed bumps are not as easy as you think mm. because, as I mentioned, I can't put them right on the stop sign. But whoever gets the be the lucky winner of the lottery that gets the speed bump put right in front of their house <laughs> gets to hear... <laughs> the slow down 
the bouncing of the car that hits it for getting to slow down and the acceleration that takes place as soon as they get past the speed bump. When we did that on Palm City Road, we got a whole new list of complaints of the people that had to deal with the speed bump activity. So it's a, it's a monitoring thing, but we, I'm, I'm happy to have the uh, chief evaluate it. And we can also, when we get the hoses finished counting the intersections, we can also do some traffic counts over there to identify it. And we can go down the speed bump discussion if you guys want, if it's the direction of the commission. Well, you know what? As I was sitting here thinking, uh, with, with all the children, maybe we should have a, a sign, two signs, you know, children. So they're not play. One on each side of a. So there's stop, something. Two different issues. Yes, sir. One is going to be Milton. One is going to be mine. He'll be the signs. I'll be the enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, as Mr. Martel alluded to, if we put a patrol car out there, everybody's going to stop at the stop sign. But I do have unmarked cars, so we will get some people out there. Yeah. And uh, address that not just for you, Mayor. It goes for anybody in the city. Well, for so. them. Um, is it in the CRA, by the way? No. Okay. I no. just wanted to make sure. But I, would, I really would like to know if we could thank get you. the... Uh, thank you. Madam Mayor. The children. Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, one of the things I just want to say, I think, to uh, Mike's comment, I had a speed bump in front of my house on Dyer for 20 years, and what I saw was cars getting air going over the speed bump, cars slowing down, enough slamming on the brakes to skid over the speed bump and then going even faster to make up the time that they lost going over the speed bump. I, and I think though people necessarily don't like these either because they create light, but I think that um, uh, the, uh, uh, the radar signs that have this tell you what your speed is and start flashing if you're going too fast, I think they actually work better. Um, but the, the, the speed bump thing, unfortunately, as someone who had two of them on my street and then the next street over had three of them, it just seemed like, uh, and if you go and look at the scrapes from people going over so fast that they scrape their vehicle, um, uh, that I'm not, a, again, I, I'm not sure that they actually accomplished the goal of slowing people down. I think it slows people down at that spot and then they go even faster to make up for the time that they lost. So the process would be having chief. Oh, so do you yeah. want the speed yeah. bumps on Study. 7th or Alamanda? 7th, right? 7th. Yeah, 7th. Right. So we're not putting any speed bumps in 7th or Alamanda. Before we do that, <laughs> we, already, we, we already have one on Alamanda. A workshop, yeah. people will come down. Don't worry, this is just yeah. a discussion. It's a discussion, yes, yes, uh, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Mr. City Manager. We got it, Chief. Right. Mike, oh, does the speed count indicate whether people are stopping at the stop sign? Absolutely not. Right. Okay. So. <laughs> but we, will, we, we will, we will we'll, we'll check the number yeah, of cars, we'll, we'll bring it back and let you know, and then we'll take your direction and we can put speed bumps in or we can put whatever other traffic calming devices. You know, in the past there's also been discussions of the median in the middle of the road or narrowing roads to make people uh, slow down as well. And I don't know if it's a slow down or a running the stop sign. <coughs> no, well, there, I need to speak to the neighbors There's still well. a few old time, right. old timers, and me included, living there. But, and I think we worry about, a lot about the children right. when they're just flying by so fast. But anyway, yes. Well, thank you. We'll, we'll move on. Um, any comments from our city manager? Um, sure. I have a couple of comments and following up to um, Commissioner Clark's comment about the PACE program. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, there are a couple of circumstances where people have received a PACE uh, loan. And essentially what a PACE loan is, is there's no credit requirement. You can apply for your, a PACE loan to have uh, certain things done to your house, and whether it's windows or solar panels or uh, efficiencies. But what happens is if you have someone that's never had a mortgage on their house for the last 20 years or since they inherited or whatever the circumstance might be, and then they get a PACE loan and there's no monthly payments, and then their, their tax bill has been $300 a year for the last 25 years, and then April 1st comes along and they owe $3,700 because 
they're used to just owing 300 on that tax bill once a year, and yeah, that's the amount, I believe it or not, there's lots of them. Um, and all of a sudden, they can't pay the tax bill. And the three years in a row, they're, they lose their home over the new windows they received. But we have had a few phone calls of some folks um, in some neighborhoods that are economically challenged that had received the funds and they aren't blaming anybody. They just don't know what to do because they don't have the money to pay the tax bill and they're essentially in default. Um, anyway, we're kind of looking into that and seeing what we can do, but there isn't much that we can do. Um, the other thing is the Environmental Stewardship Awards are coming up, and we do have um, some departments and, and employees that have won awards. I know that um, the uh, Public Works Department is, uh, has some tickets and is planning to go. I don't know how many, but as soon as it's determined which employees are being sent, if there's any extra tickets at all, I'll contact the commissioners to see if they're interested in attending. Um, then um, the Stuart Heritage uh, comment, the uh, commission has already passed a resolution authorizing the Stuart Heritage uh, to be on the uh, referendum for this August. Um, last month, the Stuart Heritage had a meeting and they provided me with a letter last week that has their proposed ballot language on the letter. I will be presenting that to the commission on the April um, 22nd meeting so that you can um, review that and authorize the language uh, for same. Uh, in addition to that, um, I spoke with our development director, uh, Jody, uh, as recently as today about this, but on April 22nd and then moving on uh, at the second meeting of each month thereafter, she is going to start giving you a um, summary presentation of what projects have been approved for the year or the last six months or however you want it and any administrative approvals that have taken place and things like that just so that we can disseminate some accurate information because um, there's lots of information that seems to be out there that isn't exactly accurate. Um, and then uh, I wanted to mention that the uh, Stuart Main Street is actually hosting the statewide Main Street Conference right now in the city of Stewart, today and tomorrow at the Flagler Center. And when I spoke to the uh, director, Candace, she said that she had 50 confirmed uh, representatives out of the 60 or to, I think there's 60 to 70 main streets in the state of Florida. And on Saturday, she had for sure at least 50 of them attending and expected even more than that, which is a pretty high percentage, which is great. And um, we ordered up some great weather for him to enjoy Stewart, so it, it worked out very well. Um, another matter that will be on the April 22nd meeting is I met with the folks that are doing the evaluation at the landfill, and they have completed um, their phase one evaluation. And it turns out that there was a landfill there before. Um, they want to move forward and incur some expenses on the phase two, but our original resolution authorized them to make the decision by April 30th. So they were asking for an extension until August. And in our discussions, I suggested that we just make it the calendar year of September 31st so that they don't have to come back again if there's any problem. But I will be putting that before the commission on the 22nd as well. Um, and then uh, the other thing I wanted to mention tonight is that the um, Finance Department received the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award and it's published for the 2023 calendar. And um, that's, that's a, really, it's a really big deal and it comes with a certificate of, red, of recognition for budget preparation that the Certificate of Recognition for Budget Preparation is presented by the Government Finance Officers Association to those individuals who have been instrumental in their government unit achieving a Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. The Distinguished Budget Presentation Award, which is the highest award in governmental budgeting, is presented to those government units whose budgets are judged to adhere to program standards. So they, again, 
this is uh, on March 19th of 2024, they received the highest um, award that they can receive for the budget they presented, which is really something. And I have to tell you, having spent last summer going through the budget with uh, Mr. Buglioli, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of information in there. And it, it's amazing to me that they juggle it and present it in a method that people can actually follow through and read it and look things up. And it's currently published, and um, it's in great shape. And I'm really proud of those guys for what they did. The finance department, if you see them, deserves some recognition for that. Um, and uh, that is all I have. I get a motion for approval of the agenda. Move to approve the agenda. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Um, any comments from the audience? Any comments from commissioners? See none. Aye. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay. Now we'll go to the public comments. First one, Ellen Murphy. Welcome, Ms. Murphy. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to introduce myself to the commissioners and Mayor Bruner. And I am a moderator for the Facebook page, the Brightline Train Community. So I'll be posting pictures of the development of the station as well as downtown events, restaurants, and shops to highlight our beautiful town. And um, so I just wanted to introduce myself, yeah. and I wondered if there's any way to find information on the groundbreaking, any timeline information? Um, or my name, my name is Mike Mortel. Um, <laughs> I will actually uh, reach out to you if you want to leave your name and number. I think you probably did on the card. I'll reach out to you tomorrow. Okay. Um, the groundbreaking probably isn't going to be this week, but we'll. we'll okay, <laughs> we know. But, um, <laughs> we'll talk in great detail tomorrow. Okay, okay. Th and thank you yeah. for the station, by the way. Thank Ms. you, Ms. Murphy. Thank you so much for coming and saying that. And I want to would like to be the first person on your Facebook your Facebook page. Okay. Thank you very well, she's much. She's already got a lot of people on it. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> Add Becky. That, that train left the station. Already. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, is it Kobe Frank? Yes. Can yes. Audio go first? Can I go first? Yeah, yes. Cool. Yeah. Right. What's the name? Then your second, uh, John uh, Minaldo. Minaudio. 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 Yeah. Minaudio. How's everyone doing? Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is John Minaudio. I go online by the name of Handsome Truth. I own the website goyamtv.com. <laughs> I also am the co-founder of gtvflyers.com. And I usually go around and I spread flyers about Jewish supremacy. And since I've done this, I've been thrown in jail. So now I'm being forced to come out here and tell you the story of what's going on. I'm a canary in the coal mine, essentially. Say, wanna, say what? I'm a canary in the coal mine, here to educate you guys. So with the show of hands, are you guys familiar with a group called the Anti-Defamation League? Well, of course. Yeah? Yeah. You know? OK. Well, I just want to give you some fun facts. So. Um, in regards to the ADL, this is a Jewish special interest group, and these are the people that are coining the term hate speech and are the punishers of cancel culture. What you don't know about this special interest group might surprise you. So this group was founded in 1913, the Anti-Defamation League, to protect a Jewish murdering pedophile named Leo Frank who murdered Mary Fagan. This is the organization in charge of determining hate speech and censoring Americans online. Are you guys familiar with this group? Continue. You are, right? Continue. Okay. So this Jewish special interest group, the ADL, openly boasts that it trains the majority of law enforcement and FBI across the United States in how to combat, quote unquote, hate speech. Not only do they cancel top celebrities who speak out against Jewish supremacy. They also cancel average Joes like myself. I have been debanked, deplatformed, can't use an Airbnb, I can't rent a car from Enterprise. When I tried to move across country from California, um, I tried to rent a Penske truck, and they said that I was on a terrorist watch list for simply distributing flyers. Um, 
what has this country come to? Uh, I'm going to uh, read you some quotes from the Jewish holy book called the Talmud. Um, you guys are probably going to say that my words are hateful, evil, bigoted, etc. But this comes. We're not going to say anything. But you got three minutes. Okay. From, how, how from much the time beginning when you started. Go ahead. Okay. So this is from the Talmud. Okay. This is their book. Okay. This is what I'm exposing. In Yebamoth 98a, it says all non-Jews are animals. In Sanhedrin 57a, it says when a Jew murders a non-Jew, there will be no death penalty. In Kathubob 11b, a man who engaged in intercourse with a girl less than three of age has done nothing wrong. Shabbat 11.6a, Jews must destroy books of the Christians. For example, the New Testament, Baba Mazia 11.4b, the non-Jews are not... Timer right here. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Greetings. I come on behalf of many millions of white founding stock Americans who have fought and bled bravely to secure our liberties found within the Constitution of the United States, most importantly, the original Bill of Rights. In recent years, it has become abundantly clear to even the most dull that our constitutional rights and liberties have been under relentless attack. My friend last year, Mr. Minadio, Handsome Truth, was charged with conspiracy to commit dumping of litter, where the state alleged that his litter was actually a cache of political and religious materials packed, neatly bound, and weighted for distribution onto driveways, essentially newspapers. <clears throat> we come to Stewart, not as enemies, as these charges are from the most ridiculous in Palm Beach County, but to come speak about our national decline. To begin, one must first define the word nation. It clearly has to come from the word natal, which implies genetics, meaning to be born. Since the 1965 Hart Cellar Immigration Act, our border has been wide open. It is very clear that the great replacement is going on and white people are being pushed aside and it is state policy that that must continue. <clears throat> the constitutional framework and laws is the software from which the government must do its responsibilities and duties the genetics are the hardware. If these two things do not match, then the government simply cannot work, or at least as it was founded and intended. <clears throat> we are not violent. We are not insane. We are rather concerned white people who are coming here to raise an issue of very legitimate concern. We call for a full investigation into the criminal element of world Jewry to engage in such brutal and inhumane conspiracy against the whites. The war in Gaza <clears throat> is on full display for the world to see, and it is clear that such barbaric terror is not being done by Palestinian children onto Israelis, but rather the reverse. The whites have also felt the terror of the Jew, most notably the Holodomor of Ukraine, the Red Terror of Bolshevik Russia, the genocide and near extinction of every Germanic person from 1939 until the destruction of the Berlin Wall. Praise God that the Germanic bloodline was able to relocate some of its best and brightest into the United States so that we could defeat the Soviet terror during the space race and the Cold War. Our greatest challenge is yet to come to defeat the greatest cancer known to all mankind, Israel. Okay, Mr. Sean Reed, are you out there? Is he left? Oh, okay. And we have uh, Karen Rudge. Please come forward. We got a show tonight. Do you actually say? Yeah. That's when you're afraid of uh, guns and. Freedom of speech. Let's just honor that. Yes, we'll just go right on. Disgusting. Oh, she's not here either. Was that your honor? I mean, that was not acceptable. Okay, madam, who did she say? Mrs. Rudge was on the list, and she's not here. She's not here. Oh, okay. going forward. Sorry. Yes. Um, so we'll see. Of the consent calendar, do I get a approval? Of the consent count, uh, except uh, fourteen. Except fourteen. Yes, we're going to pull fourteen, and uh, 
Or when we get to, yeah, we're going to pull it and because the uh, uh, the young gentlemen here want to say a few words. Okay. So I move can approval I approval of the consent calendar pulling item 14? Second. Okay, we have a, um, a motion and a second. Uh, let's see, any comments from the public? Commissioners? Okay, there's none. Uh, you don't have any for commissioners, but I just wanted to say the last meeting and this meeting, we've seen changes in our CRB and our CRA, and I just want to say that um, it shows that our city is is growing and, and adjusting and changing. I appreciate all the new members who are coming and serving on these boards. Thank you that, for that, Commissioner. Very good. Excuse uh, me, Madam Mayor. May yes. I ask who motioned and uh, seconded the, uh, the consent? Was, Thank you Commissioner so much. Rich and, Thank and, you. Let's call it second, yes. And, and take the roll, please. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Vice Mayor Rich? Yes. Mayor Broner? Yes. Okay. Road to victory. I have uh, Ray uh, Giagulo. Yes. You'd like to speak? Thanks for coming, gentlemen. I, I guess I'll I clear the air. As a Vietnam vet, I'm president of Road to Victory Military Museum. Bob is the vice president. We're a board of nine members. As a lot of you do know, we do the parades. We do everything every year. I'm not coming up here asking you guys for anything. What I woke up last week and got a phone call from the U.S. Army. We've been on a list since I've been president over five years for a tank from the government. And they called us and they said, there's a museum going defunct in Titusville, it's yours. And we are just so happy about it. But if you work with the government, you gotta go through red tape. And one of them was, Mrs. Mayor, your signature, stating that we do have a lease with the city and you guys do allow it to be there. It is not a working tank, it's a static tank. So it doesn't work. I don't have to go. I'm not going to say nothing. That's awesome. It's an M60A3, which was called the pig in Vietnam. It's a great add to our museum. I don't know how many of you have been there lately. I know I see some of your faces. Um, just to pass this out. Does it, this is just a, does it drive? Oh, no. You've oh. got to pay some big money to get it. Oh, okay. It comes on a flatbed. I wanted to drive it. <laughs> it comes with a T handle like a little kid's. It is the coolest thing. I'll is tell you turn, that. Turn? Uh, the guns are all deep. I mean, they're cut and they got bars in them. They weld the breeches. So no way can any of me or my board get mad and put a shell in it and run city, go crazy in the city like they did in California many years ago. But uh, here's a quick picture of it. If anybody's familiar with what I'm talking about. It's pretty damn big. It's when you say big, <coughs> what are you talking about? 20, 40 feet, tons. 60 feet? Uh, 23 feet with oh. the barrel 27. To give you an idea, in front of the museum, you know how that little roundabout is in the front of the museum and there's a canary palm there? It would fit perfect there, but that's not what I'm coming here. That's another thing me and Mike have been working on. <laughs> Um, we're going to go closer to the building right there. One of the, spec, uh, one of the things the city, or excuse me, the Army wants us to do is to put gravel down, which we already got the gravel part, but we weren't going to spend the money for the gravel until we had the okay to do it. Uh, the Army wants it here yesterday. We've been waiting a week to come here to hopefully get the approval. It's going to cost us almost our, all our revenues to get it here. We decided to do what it was in our budget, and the cost of it is the transportation. You can't drive it, so it gets picked up with a crane, gets put on a 13-axle humongous flatbed. They drive it from Titusville. When it gets here, another humongous crane has to pull it off, and we did all the logistics already. And I want to thank, well, Milton, Milton left. Thank you. Milton works with us really good. Mike's been a charm since he saved us when he was city attorney. Well, I'd like to say no two better men 
could have come and spoke after those two men. Two men. <laughs> and um, you said how, young. I mean, your country, your love for your country, veterans. We're getting an army tank. Uh, oh my God. I know my bell rang, <laughs> but I thank you. I know my bell rang, but I just want to tell you, I'm past chairman of the Veterans Council of Martin County, and moving the monument that's there, um, the last survivor is Dusty, who is. You know, sure. quite well. Uh -huh. He's behind the moving of the monument. We just want to move it from one side to the other, and it's getting paid for by the gentlemen that did all the work for the city, that they got to be out of there shortly. Oh, so man. if any damage happens, they're not pouring their concrete until after our tank is in spot and after, in other this words, is, no is, liability to anybody. This is what we are, true patriots of I our do country. hope so. So normally How we... Awesome read the resolution and have the agenda item before the mayor calls for public comment. So if I could have the um, city attorney read the resolution first. Yes. All right, thank you. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute, Commissioner. Um, I, I just had a question. Are, yes. Is it going to be to where the tank can be opened up? Because what I've heard you is can't. that it's going to be <laughs> welded. And I was going to beg you guys to maybe just lock it so that at some point, you know, I think of my kids. My Mr. Son Collins, let me say this. To go look in there. I've been totally dealing with the Army daily, and they want it welded. But to be truthful, I'll tell you a quick story of the VFW who got a tank. It was sitting in front of a VFW for 18 years. The Army gave it to them just like we we're getting ours. Yes. Lo and behold, the only thing it was missing was a battery. They, the <gasps> barrel was active. I mean, I couldn't believe when I heard this story. And they took it and put it back into service. They took it from the VFW. <laughs> My case, I talked to the curator of this museum where it's coming from. He says to me, you know, if you put in eight batteries, you could probably start it up. And I'm thinking to myself, that would have been great because $2,500, not cheap for the batteries. Mm -hmm. The crane alone on one side is costing us $2,500. The transportation is costing us close to five, And another 2000 just to unload it. So. I would like it to be able to look inside somehow. So the compromise I was told, I could actually weld it half open for people could look in, or I could do something with a plexiglass like cover. So we have options we could do it, and it's that not. That's going to be my only ask: is make it possible that in the future there is an escape hatch underneath that no one knows All about. Right. So well, if you come do. by, we could work something out. We also have, if anybody noticed the jet sitting there that it sort of looks like the white elephant in the room, we call it. Mm -hmm. The jet is, it used to be military. They were going to do a two-seater, and thanks to Bob, he was able to get us that fuselage. That's going to be part of the museum where it's getting mounted on the side where children could go inside, and we're working on a mock-up where, That's like, it. they could actually think they're flying with screens on it. And you guys probably don't even know, we teach rangers. We have kids from the year, from 12 to 20, with our new building in the back, well, five years since I've been there. We, I teach classes, and I have roughly 15 all together on the, on the books. And every Saturday you come in, there's usually two or three standing there giving tours in a museum. So we well, just we love where you. we are, and I don't want to go anywhere. Late my evening. That. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Madam Mayor, before he reads the resolution, yes. Mr. City Manager and Mr. Um, Leggett or Public Works, is there any additional liability requirement or anything for them to bring this massive thing into Memorial Park? Or is it's, do we have do we have a lease contract with them, right? Yeah, to me, it's not going to. I didn't believe it was going to be in Memorial Park, but rather it was going to be stored at the Road to Victory Museum. Up oh, at the air. Okay. No, but the, the, which is on the backside the, of Memorial the, Park, the but is the land the that they've place. leased essentially. So it would be within their leasehold, which would be covered by their insurance and their uh, possession. Okay. I'll move to approve. Uh, well, we no, read not the yet. It's not still. ready yet. <laughs> resolution number 44-2024, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Stewart, Florida, authorizing the mayor to sign a letter allowing a United States Army tank to be displayed on city property leased by the Road to Victory Military Museum, Inc., located at 319 East Stipman Boulevard, Stewart, Florida, 34994 as well as allowing the Road to Victory Military Museum to relocate the Franklin Monument 
if deemed appropriate, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Okay, do we have any comments from the public on this? No more questions, we're all through. Do we have a second? Motion. I have a motion, do we have a second? I, I'll, I'll have a second and I'll just say this to the lady who said she was doing the Brightline thing. Between Brightline and this location, and probably the Sailfish Ballpark itself, those actually have a Stipman Boulevard um, address or location. So, just a tidbit. Yeah. All right, we have second. a second. Second. All right, give the roll call. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Vice Mayor Rich? Yes. Mayor Bruner? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, that's yes. the end of our consent calendar. We have a Thanks. commission you're action. Thank you, you're on fire. <laughs> Memorandum of understanding, the MOU between Project Lift and the City of Stewart. Will you read that? Of course, Madam Mayor. Uh, resolution number 03-2024, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Stewart, Florida, authorizing to execute the Memorandum of Understanding between Project Lift, Inc., and the city of Stewart to create a facility referred to as the Stewart Job Training, an entrepreneur center for vocational training, workforce and professional development programming, and business incubation, which is to be located at 720 Southeast Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard uh, in Stewart, providing an effective date and for other purposes. I can Oh, hey. <laughs> I am so sorry. Go Pinal ahead. Gandhi yes, Savdas, CRA Director for the Record. Um, we've been working on this for quite some time, so we're really excited to have this on the agenda so finally. Um, as you know, we closed on the Willie Gary property um, in January, and Bob Dacchio from Project Lift is here today, and he's been waiting patiently as we work through all the details uh, for the Memorandum of Understanding. Um, so. This, uh, this MOU will finally establish a partnership with Project Lift to provide job training programs and services in our new proposed facility uh, that will be developed at 720 Southeast Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, formerly known as the Willie Gary property, with the CDBG grant that we received a couple of years ago. Uh, so as part of the grant agreement, uh, the city is responsible for developing this site with the funding that we received. Uh, Project Lift has agreed to allow the city to coordinate with their architect uh, to use these prototype of building plans and floor plans that, um, that he used for his other sites. Um, so this is somewhat uh, cost saving to us uh, so we don't have to go out and um, get new designs and floor plans. Um, so that was very helpful as part of this uh, MOU agreement. Uh, we will make some modifications to the original building plans to fit this site and also the programming. Uh, we plan to enter into a lease agreement with Project Lift prior to completion of the construction, uh, which could be sometimes um, late 2025. Uh, some of the terms are included in this MOU, um, such as the payment, uh, which would be a dollar on an annual basis for the first five years. Uh, and then they would have the exclusive right to renew the lease at the end of the f uh, initial five-year term. Um, they will also have an option to renew it five times uh, for a 10-year term each time. Um, so as part of the grant agreement, uh, Project Lift will have to provide a minimum of 50 new jobs uh, with at least 51 of those jobs uh, created for, to benefit the low and moderate income uh, family households uh, within the first five-year of the lease agreement. Uh, Project Lift will be responsible for tracking uh, the progress of the program and providing uh, CRA with the quarterly reports um, that we will have to submit uh, to Florida Commerce as uh, to comply with the grant requirements. Uh, they will also be responsible for furnishing uh, the building and providing the equipment uh, for the job training center. Uh, they'll be responsible for maintaining the property, uh, including the building, parking lot, landscaping, signage, lighting, etc. Uh, so this. This MOU will stay into effect until um, we close out on the grant. Uh, so we expect to complete construction on this site by end of 2025 and then uh, close out on this grant by March 2026. And so today staff is requesting approval of resolution number 03-2024 authorizing the city manager to execute the MOU to establish a partnership with Project, Project Lift. 
Move approval. Second. Uh, okay. Can I have a question? Yes, we have a. a, a <coughs> my, uh, commissioner. Uh, I don't have any. I don't have any problems minute, I mean, with it. I was going to. Oh. Let me. Let me finish. But. Oh, sorry. Go on. No, I, uh, we had a second. Uh, you seconded? No, no, I Mr. Uh, so I thought, Commissioner um, uh, Collins Clark. and um, second so by, uh, Commissioner by McDonald. Mr. McDonald. You may go now. Yeah, okay, yes. I knew that, Mr. Thank you. So, Mr. Zacchio, good afternoon. I don't have any problems with it, per se. I just, and I know that you have other places, your Palm City, and I think Hope Sound is being built now. Um, it just looks so busy I just think that it looks like you need more space or another level or something and I don't know maybe it's enough but it looks like every ounce of that plan is there and I'm glad that I actually saw this because the yeah. things were so small on my computer but of course it's not going to be as overpowering as the boys and girls club which is across the street but um you know, I so so is that two story that we're looking at there, just a one story prototype? Those are it's high ceilings, but it's one story. So everything that so it's as I thought, then it was just one story. Okay, that's what I I was looking at the plans. I, what 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 seems busy? <laughs> no, inside I what you, the the plans that the the, the layout the the um the floor plans and the. The build out inside is just so many. I saw the little circles and different things <laughs> where they'd have different rooms for different things. Um, so maybe if you just tell us, you know, sure. how this is going to work for us in the city. Sure. You know, it, to me, this is just it, it's a it's an opportunity um, that means a lot to to me personally, okay. being a you know a, a lifelong resident mm -hmm. of Martin County, and you know I've known you for a very very long time and. I uh, grew up um, playing football around the green. We used to call it the green monster around the, the wall around. We'd have to, you know, um, uh, be in that area. So this is that. a great opportunity for us to really um, uh, affect the change that I think is really needed for most communities. So if you take a look at the busyness that's around there, there'll be some changes based upon the interior and how that, you know, how that lays out. The interior there is office space. So is there right if I walk up to yes, the sir. to the the board guys? Oh, sorry, Becky. Like, you know, you, um, oh, you we have a we have a pointer somewhere. Getting, um, older. <laughs> they can't see as well as they used to. Do I have to turn off that? All right. So you know, one of the things that we we always have to make sure that we know, right? Is is this catching what you need for the? I'd go back to the other slide. Thank you. So one of the things that you know, I'm very passionate about mental health and substance abuse treatment and the vocational trades of being a very good replacement behavior for the, the things that our teens are going through these days. Um, one of the things that we want to try to do uh, to avoid, and to, you talk about busyness, and I'll put that back at you, is that there's a... Um, a component of swipe up on the phones that we see all the time with these young folks. They, no matter where they're coming from, they've got phones, they're swiping up and they're moving busy throughout their life. And one of the things that's not shown on here are the bays. So the bays are, there's actually two more bays that go on this side of it and then two more bays that are over the, here. That's the, your vocational the, training. The pointer screen. is to assist you in pointing at the screen. <laughs> 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 Thank you. There you, right, go. There you there go. go. Yeah. All right. So over here is the are the bays, the additional bays, and then over on this side are additional bays as well. So for us, that's an, that's where all the opportunities are. That's where the vocational training takes place: welding, carpentry, boat building, um, uh, small uh, small equipment operations, and the things that we're we're going to be teaching. But here, there's some administrative offices on on this area which we do need to fill in, right? And with the busyness you see in the Palm City areas, like you see that kind of that um, congestion that we have there, this solves a lot of that, those problems that we have. So this building is, is about, um, I think it's about 5,000 square feet bigger than what we have there in the Palm City location. So that does help us with the administrative components that's in this area. You also have opportunities for therapeutic uh, interventions one-on-one -on -one in this area and then group therapy sessions in this area 
kitchen areas and a big group room for our family style lunches that we have with the teens every single day and then family style dinners at the at the end of the night this is your bath uh, restroom area I'm sorry restroom area here and then computer lab where we have our pathway Academy of innovation the pathway Academy is the high school diploma program that we put in place several years ago because we were very frustrated with the fact that we couldn't uh, that we had these young folks on, on the street that didn't have high school diplomas. And, and to me, and I know you feel the same way, that's a shame, especially the way that we, we can operate today and having platforms all over the place. This will be one of the most critical rooms that we have. And then as you move off into, into the, uh, the Bay areas, this is likely a depiction of um, like a machining area. So that's what that depiction is. This is a depiction of a manufacturing distribution and logistics area. So how do we teach the things that these young folks really need for our communities to excel, right? Manufacturing logistics and distribution is gigantic for our area. We should be teaching those things. It's going to take up a big portion of our, of our building. And then in this area, it's not showing it, but on this side, there's an automotive repair shop, right? Again, jobs everywhere for these young folks to be able to get. Um, Again, and then a kitchen area over here on the right. This is a nice little reception area. We really want to make this place looking like an area that they will actually be going to outside of Project Lift. The reason why this building looks the way it does is so that we can be in a position to show them what the workforce really looks like outside of Project Lift. This, or, this is not a it loaded with bells and whistles. It's not, and it won't ever be. And as long as I'm the, I'm the CEO of Project Lift, we will not be putting um, buildings up that look like, you know, that, that have like bells and whistles everywhere. They need to learn to work in the shop. Right? That, that's what this is about, is the real workforce, being able to put them in a position where they understand that, the, that they are going to have to go to a, a shop that doesn't have everything that, that's needed for, to be comfortable. That's just not the case, right? It'll be safe, it'll be good, it'll be ready to go, but they will know how to work in a real shop when they're done. So that's kind of the, the, the I get passionate about this too a little bit, so I, I'll back it down. Um, <laughs> but there is also a bit of a, me, a, there's a mezzanine that actually will go over this area as well for storage and some different things, but it's not a, uh, to uh, Mr. Mortel's uh, point, it's not a two-story, you know, gigantic building in the middle of the town. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. Uh, Mr. Before you go, Mr. McDonald, I again just to Mr. Mortel, and I, I'd envisioned sometime before we had started talking to Project Lift, whatever we were going to use that property for. That hopefully we would have had all this workspace and all this stuff on a certain level, whether it's one and a half stories or two stories, and try to have some housing or some other activity there on that site, but I think that's not working. We have this MOU that we're looking to approve, and it is a large property, but I think that whatever, um, whatever you're going to do is going to be on the entire property, as, uh, or just the back, uh, just the front side, and not the, the back entire, side. It's the entire, the entire property, property. and, could, and everything could. will be removed, uh, including the current um, buildings on that yeah. site. If I could digress for one second and just yes, throw a little history, um, I think it was two and a half years ago, or maybe even three, that the commission originally voted and directed uh, Ms. Gandhi Savdas to start applying for the CDBG grant and uh, hire the um, consultant to start preparing it. They obtained the grant to purchase the property, but at the same time originally had entered into a program with Indian River State College to move some adult education programming to the site, and it was going to be a re rehab of the structures that were on the site. Mm -hmm. But um, because of hard work on behalf of our CRA director and a relationship with Mr. Zacchio, um, Pinnell went back to the well and somehow convinced them to give her well over a million more dollars toward the project so that we could build a brand new state-of-the-art 12,000 square foot building um, and she somehow got it. So it's going to be a, a everything on the site is going to be brand new. 
Thank you. Commissioner Madam, McDonald. Madam Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, first of all, Bob, thank you. And I, you know, um, this is an amazing plan and I'm, I'm really excited, especially when a couple of things. One is I grew up, I came out of the vocational world up in Ohio and, mm -hmm. and I think that vocational training is something that we're severely lacking, um, not just here, but everywhere. Right. Um, so I'm very stoked about the excitement of that, but I was, but something uh, which I did not know until you just said it right now is the, uh, is the advanced logistics and manufacturing portion of it. And if anybody's been following what's going on in economic development in Martin County, there are a couple potentially very large manufacturers looking at relocating either in Indian Town or at the airport. In fact, I think the airport is pretty much a done deal now. And that is going to create great jobs, blue collar, a lot of blue collar jobs for young people that are not able to or don't want to go or just don't think that college is right for them or um, so. And so I'm, I'm really excited because this is going to create opportunities um, for so many people. Um, I, always, I one of the things I believe I people use the term uh, social justice all the time. I believe in economic justice. Money levels the playing field. A job levels the playing field. Well, there's nothing better than coming home to, um, at the end of the day of a hard work and knowing that you earned a nice living and you can support your family and your lifestyle and live without uh, fear of what comes the next day. So. Very excited. I'm, I can't wait to see this done. Um, so congratulations this, to everybody. Hey, Pinal, congratulations to all the, your hard work and Jordan, everybody in your department and everybody at the City of Stewart and everybody at Project Please. Lift. Yeah. So thank you. thank you. I just want to mention that we're working on the site plan and the site is pretty large enough. So we are able to carve out a, a portion of the land to do for future redevelopment. Um, it, but it's, again, this is grant related, so we can't do anything until the grant terms are completed. And in the future, if the city wants to revisit that portion that's going to remain empty, the, you know, the city can at that point. Thank you. Madam, Madam uh, Mayor, if you would please allow Mr. Zacchio, if you could tell us about oh. your target population, you know, that 18, 17 sure. to 25, and whether or not they get paid when they're training and about how long a training or certification program takes. Sure, so, um, so we have three distinct programs at Project Lift. The first one starts at eight o'clock in the morning and goes until 2.30 in the afternoon. That eight o'clock group are typically teens that have dropped out of high school. So they're typically 17 years old to 25 years old. I call them rising 17 year olds, uh, the ones that are kind of like been on that bubble and really don't know what they're gonna do. Um, but we uh, start that program at 8, eight o'clock. We go through job readiness, employability. They do their mental health counseling if they're identified uh, as needing individual treatment. Uh, they do substance use um, uh, disorder treatment if that's identified as well during that time. And then they also participate in our Pathway Academy of Innovation, which is that part that I was showing you down here, which is a, a crucial piece of this. Pathway Academy of Innovation is our high school diploma program. Again, I highlight that program because I know you've been to a couple of our gra graduations, and I'll tell you what, there's nothing more special than seeing a kid that's 17, 18, 19 years old that shouldn't have been sitting in that classroom with a 14-year-old, right? Because it's very unhealthy mental health-wise for a 19-year-old boy to be sitting in a classroom with a 14-year-old teenage girl, right? It's unhealthy on both areas and see them become the most important person in their family at one of those graduations is incredible and it's life-changing. Pathway Academy then uh, switches over, after, once Pathway is done on that day, they go to a family style lunch. We all sit down as a staff and a team and we eat lunch together. That, that gives us an extra meeting time and it teaches them that that's how this works on the, on the workforce. You eat lunch at noon and then you're back at work at 1230, right? You, then you go right back into your routine and then back into hands-on high-touch vocational training until 2.30 in the afternoon. Then it switches over to the second group of teens um, that come to our second group of, of kids that come to our programs. Those are teens that are still in high school. They are typically between the ages of 14 and 19 years old, right? That's where that, that high school program then comes in. They do the same exact thing that the, uh, the, the Career Rising program does in the morning. 
uh, whether they're working on welding or carpentry, their uh, vocational training programs, their job readiness, employability, and then um, through mental health and substance use disorder training if that's um, identified for them as well. Then they have a family style meal, sit down again for the second time that day for a family style meal where we all get to sit down and break bread together and really have that moment where we can uh, come together as a team. This is very common and a lot of our teens don't have that family style opportunity. So to me, it's a very, very crucial and important component of it. Then we have uh, another program that we started about, uh, about a year, uh, two years ago. Uh, which is a full apprentice style program for electrical apprentices. We're also just about to embark into a construction apprentice program and small equipment apprenticeship programs. That runs from 5.30 p.m. until 10.30 at night on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So you talk about utilizing what we've been given. This program utilizes a building that, um, that we've been good stewards of the funds that we've been given to really impact our community in a very, very, very big way. I am not the type of, of leader that's gonna allow an empty building to sit, right? This is something that's important to our communities and we're in the way that we can uh, really change their lives in a, in a very special way. And I know you've been part of it for a long time and I can't thank this commission enough for the support on this. Pinal, uh, it's so impressive to see how efficient this has been and such an easy process to go through. I'm such a big fan of this opportunity that um, I'm really looking forward to, to knocking the cover off the ball for you guys. Well, I wanted to say when, when Mike first told me about this and that your name came up in Project Lift, I knew we were in good hands. We feel the same. Um, uh, me too, I feel this exact same way on this you side. You are yeah. so, you, you know everyone. Uh, you've got a great reputation. You've been doing it for so many years, year after year, fundraising and everything. I mean, what is your story? What made you start this? How much time y'all have? Because I, mean, I thought uh, I had three no, minutes, and I that's no, not. No, no, you have just three minutes. What makes you go? Maybe I should say that. You know, I, um, I it, it, the reality is I didn't grow up in the greatest you know environment, right? It's I know some of you know my my parents and my family. Um, my particular family didn't have the greatest start, right? Um, I would come home and the lights would be off. There was no food in the fridge. Uh, I can go all the way back to the first National Bank days when uh, Corky used to come knock on the door, right? When things were wrong, right? To see and help and care about our community. I got an opportunity because of an amazing um, teacher and an amazing friend. Her name is Samia Ferraro, who some of you know. And I was in, I was good friends with RJ, her son, and I'm sitting in her kitchen one day, um, and she says to me, this is my senior year of high school, she says, so where are you going, where are you going to college, right? And I'm looking at RJ opening acceptance letters to, sc to school, and I'm like, well, I haven't really thought about that, right? And she goes, come back here tomorrow and I'll have three applications for you. Right now, I hadn't even thought about what I was going to do. She said, you need to get out of Martin County. No, please, no, I love this place, right? And I clearly boomeranged back, really right? Good. But the bottom line was, I needed to get out of here to see and expand my horizons for what, what, I, was, what I was, who I could be, right? I had football coaches who were amazing. We had great um, leadership in those areas, but we needed to get, we, some of us need to get out of here. Um, she came back, she, got, she gave me three applications. I filled them all out, and to my surprise, I got accepted to all three. One of them was Widener University in Philadelphia, um, where I want even one of my, my good friends, Jason, Jason Razor, went um, just after me. He was right behind me on it. And I got to tell you, it was the best experience of my life. I got an opportunity to do things and see things I had never imagined. Um, and then I met a young man um, uh, while I was doing an internship up there at a, at a Wilmington, Delaware. And I was doing an internship with the Department of Juvenile Justice at Wilmington, Delaware. And my job was to drive kids back and forth from the detention centers in Philadelphia to Wilmington. So I told you it was, might be long, and I'll try to wrap it up. And I know <laughs> Mr. Mortel's like, can you just yeah. wrap this story up? So, I'm interested. We're ready. Yeah, so, so I, I know, right? I knew you would, you would think that. So I'm driving these kids back and forth. I'm 20 whatever years old, uh, very selfish in my own right, right? And um, this kid, Derek, we're, he's, I'm driving him from Philly back down to Wilmington. And 
I used to love talking to these kids in a car because they were just so like disengaged, right? They, were, they didn't want anything to do with whoever these people were. They were driving them back and forth. And so Derek was probably, in my eyes, was six foot four and just an incredibly, um, uh, just, he was just well put together, just a good man, I, a young man. I couldn't imagine what he had done wrong. He's probably about 14 or 15. And so I'm driving down the road. Now, if you know Philadelphia on the I-95 corridor, corridor in that area, it's literally eight lanes on each, each side, right? Driving south, and all of a sudden, Derek jumps over the back seat, grabs the, the steering wheel, and yanks us into the, into the wall, right? Yanks us into the wall. I thought we had been hit from behind. I didn't know what had happened, because he's in the front seat, and he yanks me into the wall. We come to a screeching stop. He opens the car door on the other side, jumps out of the car, and runs down the street, down, across the, wow. the highway. Across all 16 lanes, he jumps across the highway. Now, we didn't have cell phones at the time. It did take a little while for, for uh, you know, the police and fire rescue and all that stuff to get there. And I'm sitting there in, on the side of the road, and my supervisor shows up that was my um, supervisor for the uh, internship I was doing. And he says to me, what'd you, what'd you let him run for? That's what he said. And I thought to myself, are you kidding me right now? Like, how about we ask this question? Why did he run? What's he running from? That he thinks wherever he's going, across the highway with tractor trailers running at him is better, is better than sitting in this car. Yeah. And that to me was the change. That's what I needed. I needed to see that we could, we, that, and I needed to do something. I needed to do something about it. And that's why I'm sitting here today. Is I went back, I got a degree in uh, psychology, which by the way, all kids, if you're listening, and I'm not like all kids, like, or, like, if you're listening, don't, the degree in psychology is pretty much, you got to go further, right? You got to go, you got to go get more. So I did. I went to graduate school. I got a licensed, uh, I became a licensed psychotherapist. And I really, in earnest, really tried, tried to figure out how it is that I'm going to affect change inside of a kid's life. And that's when I was sitting in my clinical office and I was frustrated with the treatment that I was doing for these kids and getting nowhere. And I said, we're going to get you outside of that. We're going to put tools in your hand and we're going to make make the change and the difference, right? Depression, anxiety, stress, substance abuse disorders, all of those things can be replaced, right? If you put the right tool in a kid's hand. But if you don't replace that with something positive, that original nefarious behavior is going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It always does. But if you put hope and promise in, a di in, in dignity in a kid's hand for the future, they will change forever. They'll change forever. And that's, that's why these outcomes are so... When she started showing me the outcomes, um, when you, uh, Pinal, not she, sorry. When Pinal started showing me the outcomes that we needed to reach, I'm thinking to myself that we got this. We got this. Not only do we, do we have this, but I can't wait to be successful in my home city. That's what I want more than anything. You know how passionate I am. You know this will be something that will be successful. Your support on this is going to be paramount, and we're going to create... A, a, a program or a, 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 a nonprofit, you know, public entity that should be shovel ready and moved to other counties and they should study it. That's what, that's what I think is going to happen. Awesome. Sorry. I, Madam you know, I Mayor, going? I know, I, I'll keep going. And I know that Mr. Campbell Thank wants you. to say something. Yeah. So Project Lift is Martin St. Lucie County or is it national, other places? And tell us about the clam bake. If I might have missed it this year, or maybe it was, it's coming. It was Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, it was, it was Saturday. I know I missed uh, it this year. Yeah, usually, <laughs> uh, usually well, you know, well, well represented there. Um, we are in Palm Beach County and uh, St. Lucie County. So Fort Pierce is where, where our lake location is. Uh, Bell Glade. And, and now, you know, clearly, you know what we're doing in Martin County. But when I said that we wanted to expand, I told our board, I said, this, we, we're going to go somewhere with this because we're going to find the hardest kids that we can possibly find. Tell me a harder place than Bell Glade. Tell me a harder place than Port Pierce, right? Yeah. We're going to make a difference where we can make a difference. So I love that our roots are right here in Martin County, but, um, but I also know that at some point, 
uh, we will be we'll be looking at bringing this to other communities as well and we'll be able to point right back at the city of Stewart and what we've done uh, with this banner building and this ability for us to have that um, uh, what do they call it when it's like a you know a groundbreaking no just the uh, pilot program no no bigger model. than that no. <laughs> yeah you're, you're the model of what it's supposed to be it's, that's that's what we're going to be looking at this building for and what we're going to do for the community at there it's such a beautiful location for us to be able to do it's very poetic it gives us the opportunity to affect change in, in one of the cities where where I uh, spent most of my time, I spent most of my time in East Stewart playing football. That was, that was our thing. I can name off all the coaches if you want, but I don't know um, uh, if I could thank them all for what they've done. Yeah. Do we need a motion for this? No, we okay. already have. have one. Oh, we do. I hope motion. Madam Mayor. Made the Madam Mayor. Yes. Yeah. So I did attend your most recent graduation. Oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, it was fun. It was an enjoyable event. And to the point you made earlier. Obviously, I was impressed with the, uh, how proud the children were and, and their excitement and their happiness. But the families, I was very much impressed by yeah. the joy and pride these families had in seeing their children up there. And it, but that was terrific. Um, I just said, so how many people will you hire for this to staff so, this up? Uh, so our, our company right now, so Project Lift, um, as it stands, has just over 60 employees. So it's a pretty robust program. This site will have right around 20 to 21 employees, if that's what you're asking. Yes, yeah. right. But you'll take them from your current staff, or, you, or you're going to have to hire no, we'll, additional we'll, staff? No, we'll be adding them into okay. the staff. So depending on you know kind of how we section the buildings off and what we plan on doing. Like South, we're, to your point, we're building a building in Hope Sound as well. That, that building will be quite a bit smaller because it's South County. This will be our flagship. That's the word I was looking for. Flagship. Flagship. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Hey. This so, will be our flagship right here in town. And then just to clarify, so do you only work with teens or do you I, do you work with children in their 20s, early and mid-20s? So we call it uh, teenagers and young adults, right? right. So okay. 14 to 25 years old is our service, uh, our service area. We have worked with um, older than 25, and we have been no, no, very successful right. with it. So not all these children are living with their families? Um, that you're... No. Yeah, I mean, some of them are, I did say the majority of them, even under 25 years old, are living with their families, especially with considering the climate for living right now. It's a little bit difficult in terms of affordability. But the majority of the, of the teens we work with Well, are, the teens, but yeah. the older ones. Yeah, some of them are, you know. Because I know, so I remember your valedictorian yeah. got her degree and also a baby. Yeah, <laughs> so, a baby. Yeah. <laughs> she yeah. was... Um, so you really have like, some young families you're working they with. They really. are. You know, they all, the, struggle, the struggle that they have is, is the reality, right? The reason why Project Lift is successful is because we, we, fig, we cracked this code that's related to dealing with intergenerational poverty alleviation. If you don't deal with the issues that people are dealing with, right? I said earlier about lights being off and no food in the fridge. Really, the Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs it tells you exactly what you need to do right off the bat. Well, okay, so let's put programs together, put kids into those programs and tell them they have to pay to be there, number one, right? And oh, by the way, you're not gonna earn any money while you're there either, but you still have to take care of your kid and you still have to do this and there's no, there's no opportunities over here. What Project Lift does is we pay the teens and the young adults for the work that they do, for the work that they do because they're in a real supervised situation. That gives them the opportunity to be able to earn money on their own and oh, by the way, we started off paying at $15 an hour back in 2019 when we knew the legislation was coming down the road because I, one of the things that we really wanted to do was be in a position where we made, um, made, it ver made everybody very aware that $15 an hour was what we expect from the industry partner because still, still some of them are still trying to catch up at $11, $12, and they're not, they're not quite there yet. You know, what we say to them is our kids trained at 15 at $15 an hour, so if you can't beat that price, we're going to go to the next person. We're going to go to the next company and get them into a position where that well-trained teen or young adult is ready is ready to go. Well, let's so all go home now. What's that? We're ready to go home now. Can I ask you guys are ready to go home? One more, yeah. Can I just ask him one I more question? I told you I could talk forever. I, know, I, I pre warned you. So yeah. is a is a reason you feed them to teach them what eating good food is? No, because I, they don't have a meal. Right. They don't eat. 
Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, and sick. Yep. That's mm -hmm. the reasons why those that that we're having the problems that we're we're, we're having right now. Oh, right? Selma, and speaking with Selma, she says that's one of the biggest problems she yeah. encounters is these children are not getting good food. No, we'll, we'll put we we put balanced meals in front of them, yeah. but I'm I'm not sitting there going, did you get your weight no, no, of no, this no, asparagus? Right now, we don't do pizza in in subs if that's what you mean. This is a sit down, uh, you know, meatloaf and mashed potatoes meal that's what we're doing and then the healthy part is the engagement yeah right. right this engagement that we have that's where healthy parts come in but um well any other section i can talk about i'll talk about any section no, of this it's for just, 20 minutes it's a great <laughs> yeah. you know these part these partnerships are just great opportunities for your it organization is. and for the city and for the people who live in the city so it's a great this is the ideal partnership that i've been looking for to really bring this to the next level. And I cannot thank you enough, Pinal. Like, thank you, Doctor. Excellent work. And I know um, Mr. Mortel probably wants to take some credit, but we'll I don't give it over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very thank thankful you. for your team. Mike. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Zach Hill. Yeah. All right, well, what I need to ask, uh, we have a motion and a second, and you've all spoke. Any uh, comments from the public, anyone? <laughs> we don't have any, well, let's have a roll call. Okay, Thank Commissioner you. McDonald. Yes. Vice Mayor thank Rich. You. Yes. Thank Mayor you. Bruner? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, sir. <laughs>